Hello everyone, I am Demented Kirby, and welcome to my channel, The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic the Gathering format. The Brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews out of the deck techs. On this episode of The Brewery, I will be discussing my take on Marquesa the Black Rose. If you like this deck or any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description. It'll really help out the channel. Other ways you can help support the channel is with my Patreon. Higher tier patrons get access to my Discord server as well as early access to scheduled videos on YouTube. You can find a link to that down in the description as well. In fact, patrons got a chance to see this video earlier. Alright, back to the episode. Marquez is a 3-3 human with Dethrone for 1 generic, 1 blue, 1 black, and 1 red. She has a lord ability giving all your other creatures Dethrone. If that wasn't good enough, whatever a creature you control with a plus one plus one counter on it dies, you return it to the battlefield under your control at the beginning of the next end step. So not only does Dethrone provide the opportunity to place plus one plus one counters on your creatures, but if they die while having one, Marquesa reanimates them at the end of the turn. This ability is so powerful in this color identity that there are dozens of different ways to run Marquesa. She could be the commander of a deck with modular creatures for some epic hijinks. You can also use her at the helm of some persist undying shenanigans. However, more aligned to her flavor as the present usurper of Paliano, this build would be an aristocrat's one. This build aims to take advantage of Marquesa's ability to delay reanimate any creature we control with a plus one plus one counter on it. If we're in control of when our creatures die, then we can recycle them each and every turn. Since they have dethrone, we could just send them towards the player with the highest life. Since that triggers dethrone before the defending player can even assign blockers, if our creatures die in combat, they'll just return to the battlefield at the end of the turn, so it isn't a problem. There are honestly too many ways to take advantage of this but I chose ones that would work best with what I want to do in the deck. And that's value. Ashnet's Altar and Phyrexian Altar can use those creatures as ways to generate mana. If the creatures will return at the end of the turn, it's not a big deal. Altar of Dementia can also be used to mill opponents. This isn't necessarily the way we'll win the game, but it definitely hurts players who are top decking things or manipulating the top of their libraries in some way. It's also a free sack outlet, so that doesn't hurt either. Viscera Seer is another free sacrifice outlet. We can scry one off of it, which is great if we need to dig through the deck for something or to accomplish simple things like bottom decking a land to prevent getting mana flooded and other things like that. Carrion Feeder is another one costed free sacrifice outlet on a body. What I like about this zombie is that it gets plus one plus one counters with its ability. So not only can it function as a sacrifice outlet, but it getting a plus one plus one counter means that it will return at the end of the turn if it dies. Similarly, Grim Grin Corpseborn is a free sac outlet that gets plus one plus one counters when you do. Grim Grin is a great way to get rid of opponent's creatures while also being a huge beater that's difficult to get rid of if Marquesa is on the battlefield. Definitely a solid inclusion in any Marquesa deck. Sadistic Hypnotist is another free sacrifice outlet. Unfortunately, we can't use its ability at instant speed, but that's fine. It still gets the job done disrupting opponents by having them discard two cards whenever we use its ability. Pyrexian Tower is the last free sacrifice outlet in the deck. Unfortunately, since you have to tap it to use it, you can't use it indefinitely in a single turn. At least you get two black mana from it. Sneak Attack isn't technically a sacrifice outlet, but at the end of the turn, you do have to sacrifice the creature you just cheated into play. For just one red mana, this is crazy. If you're able to give it a plus one plus one counter before the end step, it dies and then returns to the battlefield at the beginning of the next end step which is the turn of the opponent who plays after you. Attrition and Vampiric Rites are actual sacrifice outlets, but similarly to Sneak Attack, aren't free. But they're incredibly useful in the deck. Attrition can destroy any non-black creature, which is great 83% of the time. Vampiric Rites gains us a life and draws us a card. Now, you'd think we'd be careful with life gain in this deck since the throne only triggers when we swing at the player with the highest life. But thankfully, Marquesa isn't the only source of plus one plus one counters in the deck. Olivia Mobilized for War can give a creature a plus one plus one counter when it enters the battlefield at the cost of discarding a card. If that weren't enough, that creature gains haste when we do. Another great card is Unspeakable Symbol. Not only does it cost three life to activate, which helps us get less life than an opponent, but it puts a plus one plus one counter on our creature for it. This can also be done at instant speed, which is great in response to anything happening at the table. However, possibly the best card in the deck is Micaeus the Unhallowed. 
Not only does he pump our non-human creatures, but he gives them undying. With him and Marquesa on the battlefield, our creatures are nigh unkillable. If they had a plus one plus one counter, Marquesa returns them to the battlefield at the end of the turn. If they didn't have a plus one plus one counter, they return immediately due to the undying. This means that you can sacrifice a creature without the plus one plus one counter to an ability, have it return afterwards. Then, do it again to have the creature return at the end of the turn. This essentially doubles our opportunities of abusing sacrifice outlets. Not only that, but this can also be abused with creatures with persist. The deck is running River Kelpie, Glen Alendra Archmage, and Puppeteer Click. On their own, these creatures are amazing in this deck. Every time a creature returns to our graveyard from the battlefield, River Kelpie draws us a card. This is amazing card advantage. Puppeteer Click can be used to steal creatures from opponents' graveyards as well as exiling them afterwards so they don't get them back. Galena Alendra Archmage can be sacrificed with one blue in order to counter a non-creature spell. Since it has both Undying and Persist, it returns to the battlefield right afterwards. For a deeper explanation of how to abuse Persist with plus one plus one counters, you can watch my Grum Gully the Generous video in the link above. If you want to understand how these interactions occur on an even deeper level, in my Masarek Kral Death Priest video in the link above, I explain these interactions in the stack in great detail. Basically, when these creatures die, both persist and undying triggered. Since they return with both counters, they cancel each other and thus are left without any counters. This can be done indefinitely. Using any of these creatures in tandem with the previously mentioned sacrifice outlets provides infinite uses. For example, when combined with Ashnet's Altar, you get infinite colorless mana. When combined with Phyrexian Altar, you get infinite colored mana. When combined with Altar of Dementia, you can completely mill all players' decks. When combined with Perforos God of the Ford, you can deal infinite damage to the entire table. And this isn't even the end of it, but I'll get into greater detail on Sacrifice for Value later on. Thanks to my chaos, you can even take advantage of creatures that sacrifice themselves. If you evoke Mole Drifter with my chaos on the battlefield, you're essentially drawing 4 cards for 3 mana. You also get to keep a 3-3 flyer afterwards. If you have either Fleshback Marauder, Merciless Executioner, or Slum Reaper sacrifice itself to its enter the battlefield trigger, it'll return to the battlefield afterwards with a plus one plus one counter. If you once more sacrifice it to itself, Marquesa will return it to the battlefield at the end of the turn without a plus one plus one counter on it. If you again sacrifice it to itself, it'll return due to undying. But if you do this again, this time they won't return to the battlefield until the beginning of the next end step since that trigger already happened. For those keeping track, a single Fleshbag Marauder was able to use its ability four times in a single turn. That's pretty oppressive. The deck also runs Playcrafter, but being a human means that my chaos won't give it undying. That's not a big deal since the ability is good enough to run it in the deck anyways. Sidisi Undead Vizier and Profanier of the Dead are also creatures that can potentially sacrifice themselves to their own ability thanks to exploit. If you do so, the undying returns them to the battlefield. Doing it again will return them at the end of the turn with Marquesa. Doing it again returns them again due to the undying. Doing it a fourth time will have them return to the battlefield at the beginning of the next end step thanks to Marquesa. Basically the same hullabaloo as with the previously mentioned Fleshback Marauder and its ilk. This is crazy with Zombie CDC since you'd be able to tutor for 4 cards in a single turn for just 5 mana. And then as it keeps returning and sacrificing itself to its exploitability, you can continue to tutor for even more cards. You're definitely exploiting that ability at this point. Naturally, the deck is also running Triskelion. Triskelion goes infinite with my chaos and can kill off the entire table. I explained this combo in my Kyrick Son of Yogmoth video, but since I made a crucial mistake there, I'll try and rectify it here. This is how it actually works. Triskelion enters the battlefield with 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, but it's not 1 1, it's a 2 2 thanks to my chaos. If you don't have a free sacrifice outlet in play, you have to remove 1 plus 1 counter from it to ping an opponent for 1 damage. Then you target itself with its other 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters. It dies without having any plus one plus one counters on it. It returns to the battlefield afterwards with an additional plus one plus one counter on it due to undying. You can then do this all over again. Just remember that the last two plus one plus one counters are for it to ping itself. Now this combo is pretty common, so I've got a little something special and spicy for you to make up for it. The deck includes Karn's Silver Golem in order to increase the jank factor a bit. Thanks to Karn, we can pay one generic to animate any non-creature artifact. Thus, if that artifact were to be destroyed, 
it has undying and returns to the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it afterwards. It's no longer a creature, but it's not gone either. Use this to protect your artifacts from spot removal or board wipes. Vandal Blast and Arsteer Command do exist after all. Karn also pairs Werewolf Rep and Rack. This might seem like a weak card in the deck, but it's still a good way to get a plus one plus one counter on a creature. Plus, if we reanimate it and sacrifice it, it returns to the battlefield with three plus one plus one counters on it. So it's also pretty easily recurable and synergistic in the deck. Notwithstanding, we can also give plus one plus one counters with lands. Opal Palace and Forge of Heroes might only be useful for giving a plus one plus one counter to Marquesa, but Guild Mage's Forum has the potential of giving a plus one plus one counter to other multicolored creatures besides Marquesa. Karn's Bastion is included as a way to make creatures with plus one plus one counters bigger. Even though it doesn't give counters of its own, it's a good mana sink and way to beef up our creatures as we're swinging in with them. It's also a land so it's not so hard to slot it in the deck. Alright, so now that we saw how we're going to facilitate Marquesa's ability, how can we abuse it? Well, we want value. One way of getting value is by drawing cards. I already mentioned Mull Drifter, but the deck also includes Thought Sponge and Toothy Imaginary Friend. Both creatures draw us cards when they die. The Sponge with its power and Toothy with its plus one plus one counters. Since these creatures get counters on their own, they're great with Marquesa. Since they'll likely die with plus one plus one counters on them, they'll come back to life later on. Solemn Simulacrum and Baleful Strix also draw cards, but it's only one for each of their triggers. That being said, the robot can also ramp when it enters the battlefield, so both of its triggers are relevant in this deck. The bird has flying and death touch, which makes it an excellent blocker as well. And if anyone blocks it if we attack with it, especially the player with the highest life, they will lose their blocker and the bird will just return at the end of the turn, drawing us a card in the process. We can also draw cards off of Disciple of Bolas. If we sacrifice a fatty with a plus 12 plus counter on it, we can draw a bunch of cards. Or we can use it as a sack outlet for a creature whose ability we want to recur or reuse. We also gain that much life. Again, that's not ideal because then we might not trigger the throne. However, if all we're doing is losing life, the throne is useless if we're dead. Grim Harris Specs, Midnight Reaper, and Harvester of Souls also help draw us a bunch of cards without themselves dying. The demon is also a great blocker in a pinch since it has death touch. Be wary of your life total with Midnight Reaper though, since it takes one life away every time it triggers. That's good if we want to trigger the throne, but bad if we might die. So be wary of your life total in case you have to sacrifice it to something in order to stop losing life. Just in case the deck is running Whip of Erebos to give our creatures lifelink. It can also reanimate a creature in a pinch, but keep in mind that we lose it afterwards. But there will come a point where it's not worth it to lose so much life for the dethroned triggers. If we're running too low on life, we have to bounce back to stay alive. Liliana Dreadhorde General also draws us a card off of our creatures dying. She can also make a body with her plus one ability, which obviously has its uses in an aristocrat's deck. Her minus four is just oppressive in this deck. She's doing us a huge favor while also hurting opponents. Her ultimate isn't really the point of running her, but if she has enough loyalty counters so that you can activate it without losing her, go for it. Naturally, this deck is running Dictate of Erebos and Grave Pack. The quintessential Aristocrats Enchantment package, these cards are just amazing here. With enough sacrifices, we can clear the board of any creature on our opponent's board. Not only will this get rid of any utility creatures and threats, but we can then swing in undeterred for the win. Skull Clamp is also included in the deck. Although it won't always kill the creature it's attached to, but when the creature it's attached to dies or is sacrificed, we get to draw two cards. It's so cheap to cast and equip that it's definitely worth including in a deck like this. Besides the previously mentioned Perforos, the deck runs Flayer of the Hatebound. With built-in Undying, it's near impossible to get rid of with Marquesa on the battlefield. But that's just a bonus. This devil deals damage to any target equal to the power of any creature entering the battlefield from our graveyard, including itself. This is crazy. If we have it on the battlefield along with an infinite combo of sacrificing a creature with both Persist and Undying, then it's game over. We can also win via combat thanks to Herald of Secret Streams. This makes all of our creatures with a plus one plus one counter unblockable. Having different ways to win is key in any deck, and this merfolk helps us get through if we're not able to win with our combos or stacks pieces. The deck also has other ways of disrupting our opponents if our stacks pieces are dealt with. Ravenous Chupacabra straight up murders a creature when it enters the battlefield. If we're able to recur it, then we can maximize its value. 
Spark Double enters the battlefield as a non-legendary copy of any creature or planeswalker we control, but with an additional plus one plus one counter on it. This is great since it already enters ready to be reanimated with Marquesa. It can enter as a copy of anything we need, including cards like Perforos or Flare of the Hatebound to duplicate the pain, or as a copy of a Stax creature like Fleshback Marauder, or a copy of Glenelendra Archmage. This clone is just a great creature because it's a Swiss Army knife depending on the situation. We can always just get rid of the board altogether too. An overloaded Cyclonic Rift always gets the job done. This can take care of any annoying enchantments that can hinder our strategy like Rest and Peace or Pillow Forts that can really delay our victory. It can also take care of blockers so that we can swing in unopposed. However, I'm running the most brutal board wipes possible for this deck, Jokel Hops and Obliterate. Why are these so brutal? Because everyone loses everything that isn't an enchantment or a planeswalker. However, we keep our creatures because they're going to return to the battlefield, whether after the spell resolves or at the beginning of the end step. So we will be the only ones left with creatures. No one will have lands to cast anything afterwards in order to deal with our board state. Navinero's Disc is also included in the deck to get rid of the enchantments the aforementioned spells don't. Again, we're the only ones who will probably keep our creatures afterwards. Keep in mind that thanks to Karn, we can also keep our artifacts if we animate them. In fact, we can also keep Navinero's Disc after it blows everything up since it'll just return to the battlefield at the end of the turn. Brutal indeed. I'm also running Pact of Negation and Swan Song for good measure. These counter spells are incredibly cheap and can be cast in response to something like Descend Upon the Sinful or any other spell that exiles all creatures. If anything were to exile our creatures, we're toast. So it's important to have other ways besides Glenelander and Archmage to deal with those cards. We also want to keep our graveyard. Elixir of Immortality is a great artifact since it shuffles our graveyard back into our library in response to Rest in Peace or Bajuka Bog entering the battlefield. It also gains us 5 life in case we've been too carefree with our life total. In order to protect Marquesa from effects that don't kill her, Lightning Greaves and Swiftfoot Boots help against anything that targets. She fares well against removal, but if anything were to transform her, then that's a different story. The rest of the deck is the mana base. The deck's running Mox Diamond, Mox Opal, Mox Amber, Crow Mox, Mana Crypt, Mana Vault, and Soul Ring for fast mana because we want Marquesa out as quickly as possible to take advantage of her ability. It's also running Talisman of Creativity, Dominance, and Indulgence. Keep in mind that the Talismans can ping us when we tap them for colored mana, so they're a great way to get us below the life total of an opponent in order to trigger the throne early on. On that note, the deck's also running all three Pain Lands, as well as City of Brass, Mana Confluence, and Fiery Island. These all lower our life when tapped for colored mana. Ancient Tomb takes it a step further by pinging us for 2 damage each time it's tapped for mana. Fetch Lands also help with lowering our life in the early game, which is why the deck is running all 10 of the ones it can. Just keep an eye out to not go too low in life. This is why the deck runs Urborg Tomb of Yawgmoth. That way we can at least tap these lands for black without having to take damage except from City of Brass at least. The rest of the lands are all three dual lands, all three shock lands, Command Tower, Reflecting Pool, Exotic Orchard, and Temple of the False God, as well as one of each basic snow land in case our opponents are running anything that benefits us for it. This brew is just an idea of how to build around Marquesa the Black Rose. As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, there are just so many different ways to build Marquesa. I took an aristocrat's approach and it's pretty fun as it is. It's resilient and responsive, so you're not just doing acrobatics with your creatures, you're doing it all for value. If you're interested in the decklist of this spicy brew of mine, you can find a link to it down in the description. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the brewers, for their patronage. I'd also like to thank anyone using my TCG Player affiliate link. That also helps out the channel. Again, apologies for my voice. I am still incredibly sick, as well as with the previous video, maybe the upcoming video. Hopefully my voice is still understandable, but the show must go on. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of The Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I am Demented Kirby, and happy brewing.